Did anybody on Tuesday say anything like this to you? Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Valentine's Day, by the way. I actually did say to someone. In the early 1950s, between Christmas and the New Year, I had feelings for a, a young woman called Anne. And we'd been to some activity and we were walking up Belle Isle Road and just before Belle Isle Circus, but, uh, I'd spoken to Anne's friend, Frida, the most Corbinites. And I said, <clears throat> do you think she might be interested in me? And before we got to the circus, she double backed it, Frida, and says, yes, she is interested in you. So we started, as they would say today, dating. Early February, Anne didn't like chocolate very much, but she liked crunchy bars and Maltesers. So we met near what is the cemetery, the third cemetery, it was a rhubarb field. And there were just the two of us, we were meeting some of our friends later on, and I'd bought her a box of Maltesers. And uh, I found out a few days later, that night she was gonna pack me in. But she couldn't bring herself to do it because I bought these Maltesers. So every Valentine's Day forever, that's what I bought her. My one regret is this, I didn't place a box of Maltesers on a coffin, I wish I'd have done that. But basically, Valentine's Day, it's uh, remembering each other in love. And Jesus' Valentine message to us is revealed at the cross. There is no more tangible display of God's love for us than Christ hanging on the cross. And Jesus has left two simple elements to focus on that sacrifice. We're going to be sharing it soon. Wine, representing his shed blood to make us clean. And bread broken, representing his body to make us all. Now the reading was about Caesarea Philippi. And it's a very, very significant place in the history of the church. The people Jesus had chosen to be his disciples had been with him some time now. And the disciples were obviously familiar with what others were saying about Jesus. But Jesus now zooms in and what is their opinion on who he is. We've been singing some lovely stuff about Jesus. And the point is, what have you got to say about Jesus? Peter, speaking for all the disciples, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus clarifies for Peter that he had not arrived at that truth unaided as it had been revealed to him through God. It's not long, we didn't read verses 22 and 23, it's not long, and if you read those two verses, before Peter, unaided this time, makes an absolute pig's ear of things, revealing like us his natural brokenness and his normal brokenness. In our re reading, Jesus spells out the requirements of discipleship, verse 24. To become a follower of Jesus, one needs to deny oneself and take up the cross. It means placing Jesus first in life. And he quotes an amazing verse, or he says something that's amazing. To strive in life to gain the whole world, and that's an impossible task. And sideline Jesus would be a poor deal and a bad exchange. In Luke 12, there's a man who has lots of barns and he's very wealthy and he gets more wealthy. 
And he makes comments like this, I'm going to pull down my bounds and build greater ones. And the message comes to him the night you're a fool. He mistook his body for his soul. And he was a fool. In Luke 18, there's a rich young ruler who has done everything right, meets Jesus, and he wants to know about eternal life. Jesus didn't say this to every rich person, but he said to this young man, get rid of your wealth, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And in one version it says he went away sorrowful. But it also says in one version, and Jesus loved him. But do you know this? Jesus did not stop him walking away. There's no forced entries in the kingdom of God. A few weeks ago, Jonathan was leading the prayer meeting and he mentioned a, a hymn that he hadn't heard until he came to this church. I think I heard Beverly Shea sing it. I married Anne in uh, 1958, August the 16th. And it was Hunslet Baptist and then we had our reception at the old church just along the road. And I asked my close friend at the time, Jim Andrews, if it sing at the reception. And this was the song I asked him to sing. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world could afford today. 28 years later, uh, my daughter Angela was married the reception was at, uh, in one of the big hotels in Leeds. It was the last wedding reception they had and it was magnificent. And I asked Jim if he'd sing the same song. I'd rather have Jesus than anything. Now I'm much, many years further on. And by the way, that's just how I feel today. Jeff Hoggard and I listened Sunday a.m. for years to Alistair Cook's letter from America on Radio 4. He was an Englishman. And one year he referred to the greatest minds in American history. And that day he just mentioned one of them called Jonathan Edwards. And in the summer of 1740, Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon exclusively to the children in his congregation. And his main point was, children ought to love the Lord Jesus Christ above all, above all things in the world. To reach the same conclusion about Jesus as Peter did at Caesarea Philippi also requires a Holy Spirit revelation to experience forgiveness and acceptance with God through Jesus, with, through what Jesus purchased for us on the cross. We, like the disciples, are aware of what some people or many people think about Jesus. In fact, it wouldn't take you long before the end of the day you might hear his name or God used as a swear word. So Jesus, by his Spirit, would focus on you and me, and especially when we think of communion, as to what is our opinion as to who Jesus is and what does he mean to you and me in our lives today? Is he the Lord Jesus Christ? And do we love him? above all things in the world?
When Wally mentioned that song to me, um, I thought of a song that Graham Kendrick had written. Um, although that hymn is one of the most challenging hymns I think you can see. Um, but it's all I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, there is no greater. Th All I was held dear, built my life upon. All this world revealed and was to all. All I once thought dear, I have counted lost, spent and worthless now. pray. Lord Jesus, there is a, a cry in all our hearts, the desire to be loved, the desire to be accepted, the desire to be welcomed, and all of us in this place know about love. But we cannot imagine 
loving someone to the point of dying for them and such a cruel death in one version that awful word rejected so Lord Jesus in these moments together by the power of your Holy Spirit we pray that you will become very precious to us in these moments and that we might be able to say however we express it thank you Lord Jesus because you love us and you've demonstrated it once and for all time we thank you because we do this service this morning of communion something you ask us to do to remember you and we only do it until you return again so do bless us in Jesus name Amen, Amen. I went to see my daughter and her husband in Ilkley on Thursday they came up for part of the week and they had some wonderful walks around that amazing area and um, I just I learned about one of my granddaughter's friends who I've met a really really lovely person so attractive so bright and uh, just found out that her partner and they're planning to marry next year a partner uh, said to her the other day I don't know whether I love you anymore and actually said you're boring how hurtful but you know whatever mess up you and I make Jesus will never say that to you and me he will always love you I'm reading a book at the moment that Jeff got for me and it goes on and on. It's who Jesus is. It's who God is. Never to reject you. Even when you make all the mistakes, if you return to him, he will never ever reject you. I just wrote one or two words down. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? It's from 1 Corinthians 10. The bread that we break, is it not the body of Christ? And in this little simple service, the bread still remains bread. This is not alcoholic wine, but it's a representation of the blood that was shed that day. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he come so his body was broken and when you received the bread uh, just give thanks in your own heart for who Jesus is and what he wants to mean to you thank you know that it's very sweet to our taste but just think 
as to what it was for Jesus on the cross crying to God his father my God my God why hast thou forsaken me because his father couldn't look on sin that's what Jesus became that day who knew no sin in order that we might know complete forgiveness Amen
What a beautiful name it is, the name. 